back everyone to Revive School and uh, hey I'm, my name's Ryan Schrag and I'm one of the team members with Time to Revive and I'm serving in Sarasota, Florida and so it's awesome to be back with you. We're going to jump in today to John 18. Hasn't John been fun to, to study this? This is a, an awesome book and you know we're coming to the end of a section where Jesus is preparing the disciples for his, his death and then his resurrection. So we went through the last four or five chapters where it's just basically Jesus teaching his disciples. He's talking to them. He's like, guys, this is what's coming. This is what you can expect. And this is how I'd like you to, to lead in all of this. Imagine this. We're taking that. We're setting that aside. Now it's game time. You know, Jesus said, I'm preparing you. And now all of a sudden we're jumping into chapter 18. And it's, it's almost like they've been sitting in the locker room. And now it's time to get out on the court. And this is actually going to start playing out right in front of their eyes. The very thing that, that Jesus had been preparing the disciples for. So I want to look today at the beginning here at five symbols. There's a lot of symbolism in the book of John. And I want to look at just five um, symbols of what happened with Jesus going to the garden and then throughout all the way up through his trial. So let's jump into verse 1 of John 18. It says this, When Jesus had spoken these words, meaning all of these last several chapters, after he was done, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Another translation says that is the, the, the Kidron Valley, that Brook Kidron. And so just by way of a visual, I want to just throw up this, this painting and this map over here. This is Jerusalem. And imagine this is the, east, the eastern wall of Jerusalem. So this is the east side. This valley that is running through is the Kidron Valley. So Jesus would actually come out of Jerusalem, cross the Kidron Valley. This is the Mount of Olives. So somewhere in this area, there was this Garden of Gethsemane. So, and it sat on the western side, the western slope of the Mount of Olives. So imagine Jesus just wanting to get away with his disciples because of the crowds that were in Jerusalem, especially around the Passover, to just say, you know what, let's just get away and be with the Father. Or let's just get away with just us. And so they'd cross over this valley, come into a garden. Some say this garden could have even been walled in, um, that he would enter in. It was just kind of his place to just get away. And you guys, I hope that you have a place like that where you just get away and go be with the Father. But interesting enough, do you guys know who else crossed the Kidron Valley as they were fleeing? Anybody? David. David. Good job, Kevin. We didn't even talk about this. It's, it's awesome imagery, the fact that when you look at the life of King David and you look at Christ, both of them fled um, well, they didn't, Jesus didn't flee. David was fleeing, but both of them were betrayed by their own nation and also betrayed by somebody that was close to them. So what I want to show you is just five symbols, and the first one being actually the garden. And what the garden represents here is obedience. So Christ... So last time I spelled something wrong, evidently. Guys, that look all right to you? Obedience, good, thank you. So... And this is from uh, 18, verse 1. When Christ went to the garden, this is some place where he went often with his disciples. So he wasn't hiding. He knew that his hour had come. Like he was not running away from what was coming. He was walking in obedience into what was happening. He, he walked right to it. So isn't it, isn't it cool the fact that human history, and we know this, we talked about it, a couple months ago, started in a garden, right, with Adam. God put Adam into the Garden of Eden. Adam, you guys know the story, he ended up eating of this uh, apple, and at that point, all of the sin and death to mankind came into the world. Adam was cast out. And now, Christ is coming into a garden, representing the opposite of that, representing obedience. And through his obedience, we see just righteousness and life coming through his act of obedience. And then, Kevin, if you could go to Revelation 22. Verse 1, this is just awesome imagery of actually kind of another garden, you could say, that's coming. It says this in Revelation, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of, water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations." Awesome imagery that, okay, Eden represented this garden of, of sin and disobedience. Gethsemane was this garden of obedience. Christ was totally obedient and submission. And at some point, 
the new Jerusalem, heaven's going to be this place where there's this, this stream and then and the tree of life and fruit and all of this kind of like delight and satisfaction. So it's awesome imagery here with the garden. We look at verse two, it says this, and Judas who betrayed him, he also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So I'm actually going to say number two here. I'm going to take a uh, go out on a limb here and, and do a stretch because this does not actually talk about this in John. But we know Judas betrayed Christ with a kiss, right? He went up and the sign was that he was going, whoever, whoever I kiss. Actually, I'm going to show you this where it says it in Matthew. Kevin, Matthew 26, uh, starting at verse 48, please, if you'd go there. You guys know at that time, a kiss was a sign of affection and devotion. Like when family members would greet each other, they would greet each other with a kiss. And when they would leave, there would be a kiss that they would, they would leave with. And also, disciples would go and they would greet the rabbi with a kiss. And that was meaning that it was a sign of devotion and obedience. And here in Matthew, it says, Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one sees him. And it goes on in verse 49. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. So the kiss was actually a symbol of treachery. What was meant for to say that, man, I'm following you. I am for you. I, I just I, am, I want to be obedient to you. I'm devoted was actually just this this mark of treachery. And so that was that was number two, the kiss. Now, now going on to let's go to verse three here and keep going in, in uh, John 18. It says this, then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches and weapons. Interesting enough, a detachment of troops, another uh, translation says a cohort. There could have been quite possibly up to 200 troops that came with Judas. They didn't know what to expect. Like, right, there was just, they didn't know if there was going to be a great fight going on. A little did they know Peter was waiting in the midst. And what I love is the fact that going on, I just want to show you something in verse 4. Let's go on to verse 4, Kevin. It says this, Therefore, Jesus, knowing all things that would come upon him, he went forward and he said to them, Who are you seeking? This is not Jesus who is shrinking back, hiding behind an olive tree, saying, Oh, no, they're coming. Let's, let's try to get out of here, guys. It's like he knew his hour. And know this, Jesus was in full control of the situation. Like he knew it was his time before this. He was avoiding things because it was not his time. As a matter of fact, he would heal people and say, you know what, go, don't go and tell anybody yet because he knew it wasn't his time. Now it was his time. He's in full control over it. In obedience, he just walks forward and said, like, who are you guys looking for? He knew it, but he just wanted them to say it. So verse 5 says this going on. They said this, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Verse 6 says this, Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And I just, I just think that is an awesome, awesome verse right there. Those two verses. We have been looking at all of the I am's that he is talking about. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the good shepherd, the, the resurrection and the life. All of this. I'm the bread of life. But could it possibly be in that moment when Jesus said, I am he could that could have been maybe the sum of all this that he was just like bringing to these guys and maybe quite possibly just the, the, the weight of that power, that authority. The guards could not even stand up against it. He, he said who he was and that just came and they actually drew back and fell to the ground. Interesting enough, say what you want, but the presence of the Lord was so strong it made them fall to the ground. I just as Gordy says, I don't write this. I'm just reading what it says. And so that's that's super powerful. He just like steps up and says, yep, that, this is who I am. So let's just go on here. Verse seven. Then he asked them again. He said, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Who was he talking about, you guys? His disciples. His disciples. Let these guys go. Take me. He was like protecting them. Verse nine that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. All right, now we get to jump into verse 10. Then Simon Peter, of course, Simon Peter, having a sword 
And this quite possibly could have been a dagger. Actually, instead of big swords, some of the wording and, and what they had back then, it might have just been a dagger. He drew it and he came and he just strikes the high priest, the servant, and cut off his right ear. Just and the servant's name was Malchus, right? This, the, John's actually the only one who names Peter and Malchus in this story. And I'm just watching this scene play out. So, you know what? Let's just do this. Number three. Number three is the sword. And actually what the sword here is representing is really rebellion. How many times did, did Jesus try to tell Peter what was coming? And Peter's like, nope, we're not going to have that. I mean, we even see that he did it in, um, uh, in Matthew 16. Matthew, he, in, in Matthew, P, uh, Jesus was telling his disciples what's about to come, that he was going to suffer, that he's going to be delivered, and he was going to be crucified. Peter actually is like, this will never happen to you, Lord. You remember Jesus' response? Get behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. You know, you got to kind of love Peter's zeal. And we need people that are zealous for the Lord. You know what Peter needed a little bit is somebody, maybe a, maybe a father or, mo or a father in the faith to just come and say, okay, I love your zeal. Maybe we need to come now and let's, let, let's guide it into a way that's going to be super useful because Peter was actually coming against what actually the will of God was in these situations. Like P Jesus was stepping forward to go into what he knew needed to have happen. Peter was there saying, nope, this isn't going to happen. I'm actually going to cut your ear off and kind of getting in the way of what really needed to have happened because he couldn't see past himself and he couldn't see past what the current situation, even though Christ was trying to tell him these things were going to happen. But here's the cool thing. Not only did, and did Jesus heal his ear, but through all that Peter went through, God redeemed Peter. And he was used mightily. You know, it, it says here that Peter used, um, I love what Wearsby says. Peter, at that point, he fought the wrong enemy, used the wrong weapon, had the wrong motive, and accomplished the wrong results. But God redeemed it because here's what happened. Peter discovered what, his, what the real battle was about, and he actually discovered what the real weapon that he had. Kevin, could you go to Ephesians 6, 17? We know these verses well, but this is what, this is what Peter started to use after after Pentecost, he said this, talking about the, you know, the armor, that the spiritual armor that we are to put on. He says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Before he had another sword, right? And he's cutting people's ear off. Now he's, he's using the sword of the spirit, which is what? Which is the word of God. Now go with me to Hebrews 4.12. In Hebrews, it's just another verse that talks about this. He says, For the word of God is living and it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of thoughts and an intents of the heart. So Peter, after that, he discovered what his real weapon was, what the real warfare is. And isn't it cool? He used this weapon, and in one day, in the day of Pentecost, over 3,000 souls came to know him. And so it's awesome to see Peter actually redeemed and being used mightily. And, and I love that God uses anybody. God can use anybody that's just yielded to him. So good stuff talking about even the sword. So let's go on. Uh, verse 11 at that. So Jesus said to Peter, he's like, Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup for which my father has given me? So the fourth uh, symbol here is the cup. Do you guys remember another time when Jesus talked about a cup? Um, this is in Matthew, Matthew 26, in verse 39. The cup here actually represents submission. He was submitting himself to, to the Father. So there's several times when Jesus talks about cups. This time in Matthew 26, he went a little farther and he fell on his face. This is before he was arrested and he, and he prayed and he said, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then in verse 42 in that same chapter, Kevin, if you could go there, he says it again. In the same time when he's getting away in the garden with his disciples, again, a second time he went away and he prayed saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. 
So he did not back away in submission. He just went forward. And, you know, biblically, the cup many times just kind of represents suffering and sorrow. And even in the Old Testament, you don't have to go there, but in Isaiah, it talks about when Babylon captures Jerusalem, it says, you have drunk of the, of the hand of the Lord, the cup of his fury. Jeremiah also has a picture of God's wrath that comes against uh, as a pouring out of a cup. And so here's a cool thing, though. As followers of Christ, you and I, you know, there's times when we get, we get dealt hands. We, and we, we feel like sometimes we're drinking of a cup of, of suffering. But isn't it so comforting to know that because Christ went forward and he drank from this cup and he did the will of, the God, of, of his Father, that you and I know that anything that we go through, that somehow God's going to use it for his glory. That we're not alone in it. That we can go through anything, any cup that we know we're not alone in it because of what Christ did, because he went forward and he, and he drank from this cup. So we praise the Lord for that. So I'm going to go on it here and then we're going to come back. I want to skip a couple verses, but then I want to come back to this. So let's go on to uh, verse 15, Kevin, from here. Now we're coming to the part where, you know, earlier in, ver in chapter 13, Jesus actually predicted the fact that Peter was going to deny him. And, and Peter's like, you know what, I will, I'll, I'll never deny you. And Jesus is like, Peter, you know, before the, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Here's where we start to see that played out. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest, and he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter, he stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her and kept the door and brought Peter in. Two more verses here. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Verse 18, now the servants' officers who made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So the fifth symbol here is, is the fire. And what the fire here is representing is, is denial. Isn't it interesting that, that Jesus told the guards, he's like, you know what, take me, let these other guys get out of here. Let them flee. They all fled except for Peter and the other disciple could quite possibly have been John. Uh, there could have been a couple others that it might have been, but let's just say it's John. Peter was there and he is actually sitting with, in this atmosphere, sitting with ones who are accusing him. Maybe he should have been out somewhere else, but if you look at something, go to Psalm 1. Peter put himself in a situation, could, quite possibly you could say he put himself in the way of, of temptation. And because he was there, because he did not leave, he did something that he never thought he would ever do. And Psalm 1, 1 basically, basically says this, excuse me, says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Verse 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his delight... He meditates day and night. So what did Peter do in this situation? Even as you're looking and comparing it to Psalm 1, he said he, it just, he walked in the counsel in the, of the ungodly. He went to where all of this was going on, the high priest and all the others. He probably should have gotten out of there. And then he says he stood with the enemy by the fire. So instead of him being accused he, and leaving, he kind of stood there, was accused again the second time he denied Christ. And then thirdly, in Luke, it actually says, then he sat down with the enemy. So he stood with them, and then he, and he, he walked with them, he stood with them, and then he sat with them. Well, 2 Timothy says, flee. Like when we're faced with something, get out of there. Actually flee. Flee temptation. And so Peter stood in there and he did something that he never actually thought he would do. So interesting enough, when we look at what Peter did right there, we can say, man, I, Peter, I, I can't believe you walked with Jesus this long and yet you denied him so, so blatantly. Before we accuse him of something, how often, how easy is it for us to actually in a way deny Jesus because we are content with staying in the upper room? Where, where, where the good teaching was, where I'm surrounded by those that I like, and I will never actually go out and proclaim Jesus. So in a way, because of my just staying around, you know, the people that I'm comfortable with and not actually walking, and we've been talking a lot in John about actually doing and walking out. In a way, could we not be denying Jesus? And so 
man, I look at my own life. I'm like, before I accuse Peter of something, I need to look at, am I actually in some ways denying it? Or am I going forth as Christ did in obedience? So now we're going to enter into this part where Jesus starts walking into these trials. So let's jump back to 12, Kevin, if you would. It says this, Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus, and they bound him. And they led him away to, to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And then one more. And that was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So Jesus was being led into two different trials that were coming up here. One was a Jewish trial or the religious trial. Another one then was a Roman trial or a civil trial. The first part of this, and understand only John mentions Annas as, the, as an unofficial high priest at that time. He used to be the high priest. But then he is not anymore, and his son-in-law Caiaphas was, but they still re reverenced him, and they, uh, they, they, they recognized him as still high priest. So he wanted to get Jesus to say something that, to make him seem like he was an enemy to, Roman, to Rome, because they needed Rome's approval for Jesus to be crucified. So they were, they were questioning him. So they brought him before Annas. And you guys know there are three, three parts of these trials. The first one, he's before Annas. They were interrogating him. And then he was brought before Caiaphas and some of the members of the Sanhedrin. And then later he was brought the next morning before the council. And that's where they, they condemned Jesus to death. Let's look at uh, verse 24 here, Kevin. So then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now from here, it jumps back to Peter's denial. So let's jump ahead to verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. You guys understand how prophecy is being fulfilled, because if they had led him away and just killed Jesus, biblically, prophecy says Jesus was going to die by crucifixion. They didn't, they didn't know that, but they, they had to, this is the, one of the reasons why Rome had to give their approval because the Romans uh, killed people by crucifixion. But it was not legal for these Jewish leaders to have Jesus killed. They needed to have Rome give their approval to this. So they had to prove that Jesus did something to be a threat to the Roman government and to their dynasty. Because they actually didn't care if, if they're saying that Jesus was blaspheming. Like, big deal. Show me something that, that is worthy of him dying. So they led him into the praetorium, but they themselves would not go into there. This is like the inner sanction of where Pilate was. Now, Pilate was, a, he was like one of the governors, and he was actually only in town because of the Passover. Because he was afraid there might be a Jewish uprising. So he wanted to kind of come and give order to things. So why would they not enter in? Because they did not want to be defiled so that they could not eat of the Passover and take, take part in all of these uh, the celebrations and all that were going on. And so Constable says this, Ironically, these Jews were taking extreme precautions to avoid ritual defilement, while at the same time preparing to murder the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Unbelievable that the very Messiah, Yeshua, was in their midst right there and they could not see it. They were religious, but they could not see the truth that was standing right in front of them. So they brought him before Pilate. Let's start at verse 31. Then Pilate said to him, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying what death he would die. So it was not lawful for them to put anybody to death. They needed Pilate to say he's guilty. But you got to understand this. Pilate did not want to get in this game. He did not, he did not want to enter this. He's trying to keep rest, but at the same time, he wanted to show the Jews that, you know, that he was trying to, to mediate this whole situation, trying to find some kind of loophole that he could um, get Jesus off, and nothing, nothing was working. Kevin, if you could pull up Galatians 3.13, this is the verse that we were looking at, that they said that th Jesus said these words that they might be fulfilled, signifying by what death he was going to die. In Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So this is what Jesus was walking forward to do, 
is redeeming us, mankind, from the curse of the law because he became a curse for us. He took all the punishment, all the curse of sin upon himself so that you and I can walk in freedom. Amazing, amazing stuff. So Pilate went back to his headquarters. He summoned Jesus and he says this, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? And I love Jesus. Instead, of, instead he, just, he just asked him a question. It's almost like when, you, when we're in the city, one of the things we teach as we're, as we're uh, teaching people to uh, go forth and, and proclaim the gospel is love, listen, discern, and respond. And you see Jesus doing this. He, I know that he loved Pilate. He was listening. And in his discernment, he actually asked him a question. He's like, are you speaking for yourself or did others tell you this? Like almost waiting for Pilate to say, are you actually seeking after me? Or are you just wanting to just, you know, make the Jews, give the Jews what they want? So Jesus then, for lack of time here, let me just, let me just shoot over to this next verse. I want to go down to 37. Pilate therefore said, Are you the king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. He said this, Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Next verse says this, Pilate said to them, What is truth? I'm going to stop there. Who knows how Pilate said this? He might have been like, What is truth? Or he could have been like, What is truth? Like he didn't know. We don't know this, but he was in the presence of truth. And, and Christ said, those who do not know me, they, they don't hear my voice like truth. We learned the other day, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You guys, there's a lot here. And I'll just say this as we conclude this section. This is the reason Christ came to earth. Like he, he walked, he was the sinless, spotless lamb of God that walked this out, that had his disciples, that showed them what was about to happen. And then he walked into it, knowing what was about to happen. He knew that he was going to be falsely accused, falsely arrested, beaten. He was slapped. He was spit on. He was brought into false trials, falsely accused. All of this, all the while he held all the power known to man that he could have just in an instant just wiped all of them clean. But his power was actually revealed in his containment of all of his power, allowing this to happen because he was walking in obedience. And when that, when that message sinks in that he did that for me and he did that for you, what does that do to us? Man, that just makes me like, wow, who would do that for me? Who would do that for people that were accusing him and hating him? And that was you and I. But Jesus is like, man, I came and I died for you, that you would live for me that you would give me your entire life. If we can watch this story unfold and look at that and be like, eh, whatever, I'm just gonna live a lukewarm life, then we don't actually get it. And we need to go back and just let it sink down deep into our hearts that it actually just goes into every crevice because he did this for you so that we can live in freedom. It's awesome. When we find Christ, we know the truth. Biblically, the truth sets us free. So my prayer is that we just walk in freedom, the freedom that Jesus gave his life that we can walk in. So this has been a great journey. So God bless you guys. Look forward to uh, next time. So see ya.